Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ava Landgraf from Detroit Audubon. I am our research coordinator. Um, and I am here today to talk about how to bring birds to whatever space, whether that is a yard or park or whatever you are working with. Um, so if you guys want to uh, scroll over, scroll over the mouse um, along the top or the bottom, um, and you can open up the chat. And then in the chat, you can introduce yourself and where you're from, uh, just so we know who's here. Um, and you can also put any questions in the chat. Our uh, program coordinator, Sarah, is on the chat, and so she will be recording all of those questions, um, and we'll go over those at the end. Um, and then Michelle Surian from Wayne State University is here with us, and she is a native plant expert. Um, so she will be going over that section of the presentation. Um, so let's get started. Okay, um, so to begin this presentation, I just want to discuss how important um, these these small habitats that we can create are. Um, I'm sure many of you know about the uh, study that came out pretty recently, um, looking at the drastic declines in bird populations. Um, we've had, there's about 2.5 billion migratory birds lost um, since 1970. Um, and, and there's been really crazy numbers, but what is really interesting to me um, is that some species of birds over in the bottom uh, right corner, you can see that this little pie chart shows the birds that have increased in population size. Um, so a lot of these significant birds are turkeys and grouse, um, raptors, and ducks and geese have all increased. And those are birds that have had a lot of conservation efforts focused on them, um, especially the ducks and geese and the uh, turkeys and grouse are because of a lot of um, wildlife hunters. Um, they have been taking care of those bird populations. So that shows that it is possible if we take care of bird populations, if we put in an effort to preserve their habitat, um, we can increase their populations. So up here in the upper right, we have this much larger graph that shows all of the different birds that are facing major declines. And the number one reason for decline is habitat loss. Um, I believe one scientist was quoted saying the main causes for bird decline are habitat loss, habitat loss, and habitat loss. So it's really important to try to recreate some of this habitat where we can. 54% of the U.S. is now developed as suburban or urban habitat um, or urban areas. Um, and almost all of those areas are, are not able to function as habitat for most birds. There's some birds that can survive in the um, spaces around us, maybe like robins and house sparrows, starlings. Um, but if we, if we change and we try to increase the resources that are available to them, we can create more habitat for more species of birds, and especially the birds that are really struggling. So yes, it is time to bring back bird habitat. Um, and so I'm going to start this off with just part one, things to avoid. Um, if you want to create bird habitat, you have to be conscious of these things. Um, if you have a lot of outdoor cats around your house, then you probably don't want to try to create bird habitat in that area because that will not end up well for the birds. So yes, cats, we're starting with cats. Um, a lot of people don't realize um, the impact that cats have on bird populations. But over in this graph here, you can see that this, the, the graph on the left side, um, you can see that this, this giant bar um, is the um, number of birds that are killed by cats. And it's so much bigger than all of these others. Um, you cry audio. <laughs> all the um, uh, window collisions, cars, power lines, wind turbines, all of that just does not compare to the number that are killed by cats. Um, and that includes outdoor, outdoor cats and feral cats. Um, 
barnyard cats, all of them have a have an effect on the wildlife because unfortunately cats are just really talented hunters and they like to hunt to play. They were, aren't just gonna hunt when they're hungry. Um, so, so keeping outdoor cats fed or keeping feral cats fed is not going to solve the problem. They will still be hunting for birds. Um, and especially in the spring and summer, we have little fledglings hopping around, young birds that are not great at flying yet. Um, and those birds will not be able to escape from a cat. Um, and it's all, this is also good for cats. Uh, I wanna emphasize that cats live much longer when they stay inside. Um, they're probably a little bit more bored, um, but they are much, much safer. Uh, the next thing to consider is windows. Um, after cats, windows are the number two um, direct human cause reason for bird decline. Um, and about 40% of the birds that are killed by windows are from residential building windows. Um, so that means if you have a large window, um, if you have a window where you have seen a bird fly into it um, or found a dead bird by it, that means that probably several too many birds have flown into that window. Um, many birds will hit a window, fly away, um, and then sometimes the swelling in their head will end up killing them. Um, so we don't, we don't even see all of the birds that are affected by these windows. Um, so, so just pay attention to these windows. You want to be cognizant and make sure that you're not luring birds into an area that has a ton of windows that are going to be dangerous for them. Um, if you do have a large window like this one, there's a ton of different options that you can look into. Um, there's a lot of online resources. Um, and if you need help accessing any of this, please email us. We will share some information at the end of the PowerPoint um, with our email. So if you need help, just send us an email and we can help you out. Um, feeders, if you have feeders, this actually um, pretty drastically increases the number of window collisions you have. So it's actually helpful to keep your um, feeders a little bit closer to the window. Um, and that way, if the birds are flying from the feeder, they're not able to build up as much speed and they won't be able to hurt themselves. Uh, the number three thing that I would like um, you guys to avoid when creating your bird habitat is pesticides. Um, so many birds depend on bugs for uh, feeding and especially for feeding their babies. They really need that high protein source um, to keep their babies fed and to keep the babies growing up strong. Um, and so if you're using pesticides, you're killing the bird's food. Um, chemicals in pesticides, fertilizers, herbicides, all of that kind of is eaten by the bugs and then the birds eat the bugs and then they get into the birds and, and many birds do die from pesticides and herbicides um, every year. So taking out pesticides or, or just decreasing the amount that you use can have a very big difference. And so for part two, um, these are what I like to call the classics. Um, so our bird baths and our bird feeders and houses. Um, this is kind of the stuff that we typically think of when attracting birds. So the first thing is water. Um, water is so great because um, any, you can just put a little dish out um, and, and fill that with water and that is, completely free. You don't have to be buying things for that. Um, so that's a really nice way, a cheap and nice way um, that you can provide a really important resource to birds. Um, some people are able to do these kind of fancy fountain moving water systems. Um, and that's nice and that will help attract more birds, but you definitely don't need to have anything fancy like that. Um, I also really like bird baths because when birds are fluffing their feathers and doing their little dance in the bath. It's very, very cute. Um, so with water, if you're gonna be providing water, just make sure that you're cleaning out that water um, every day, every couple days. Um, keeping that water fresh and clean keeps your birds healthy. Um, and then water in winter is a really big thing um, since all of the water is frozen into ice or snow. Um, actually water can be a very limiting resource. And so if you're providing water to birds, either if you're just 
putting water out there um, pretty regularly, if you're able to provide a, a heated water dish so the water can't freeze, um, birds will really, really love that and you will see many birds um, coming to use that resource. Uh, next, we have bird feeders. Um, there's tons of different bird feeders um, and tons of different things that you can put in them. Um, one of my favorite things is this um, thistle or uh, Niger seed. Um, it's actually not thistle. thistle. <laughs> People just started calling it that, but it's, it's technically called Niger seed. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and, and that's really like by finches. Over here on the right, we have a bunch of little finches that are eating that kind of seed. Um, finches like that, chickadees, cardinals, a lot of those little birds. Um, and some of our other birds that we don't like to attract as much, um, the invasive species uh, such as European starlings and house sparrows do not like um, this type of seed. It's too small for them. Um, so this is a way that you're able to see more birds and not have your feeders just overrun with um, some of the invasive species that are um, very uh, territorial and, and can be very aggressive towards other birds and just monopolize your feeders. Um, Another thing that you can do to try and um, not have as many house sparrows is using some of these larger um, nuts like peanuts, um, stuff like that. You'll get more of these little woodpecker type guys or cardinals, blue jays, things that are a little bit bigger that can handle um, those bigger pieces of food. Um, for um, also decreasing the amount of house sparrows, uh, avoiding millet or cracked corn is good. That's not very high quality food and not a lot of birds like it. So if you do use millet and cracked corn, you end up with just a lot of house sparrows. Um, so these are some things to think about. Think about what birds you're feeding, if you're supporting um, our nice native birds, or if you're supporting the invasive birds that do, that do, even though they are birds and we still love them, they have a negative effect on the other birds. Um, just some more things to keep in mind. Um, cleaning feeders is important. Um, you'll want to clean them out regularly uh, so that the birds are not um, spreading diseases or bacteria or anything. Um, there is finch eye syndrome to be aware of. Um, some stores will offer feeder cleaning for you um, and keeping less seed in your feeder at a time will help keep it fresh because um, you don't want seed sitting out there for a super long time before the birds eat it. Um, there's also this no mess blend of food um, that is sold at Wild Birds Unlimited and other places and it's really nice there's no shells and so it's a lot cleaner um, it is a little bit expensive, um, but people really like the fact that it um, doesn't have the shells that fall all over the ground. Hummingbird food. The hummingbirds are great and everybody loves feeding them. Um, the hummingbird food is also nice because you're just feeding hummingbirds. There's no way that a house sparrow or a European starling is going to try to use this nectar. Um, so it's a good resource if you're, if you're looking for a specific bird that is hummingbirds. Um, the way that you can create hummingbird food is with a four to one water to sugar ratio. Um, so I would suggest two cups of water and a half cup of sugar. Um, you boil that and then you put it in your feeder um, and that's all you need. Again, that's really important to keep that clean regularly. Um, if you're not cleaning it regularly, you could be um, really severely harming the birds because sugar will grow um, kind of like funguses and bacteria very quickly. Um, and the last thing with feeding is the Orioles and their oranges. Um, I would suggest just sticking with oranges uh, for feeding Orioles. There's uh, a lot of sugar in jelly um, and, and not as many vitamins. And there can also be different preservatives that, that might not be very good for the birds. Um, so I suggest just sticking with oranges um, and, and not doing the jelly for the Orioles. 
They love their oranges though. It's very, very cute. Um, and then another thing that I like to highlight, I know that a lot of people are worried about squirrels and at night attracting rats. And if that's something that you're worried about, then feeders are probably not for you. And you can look more into native plants. Um, with native plants, you're allowed to, you're able to really support birds without providing food to um, some of these rodents and uh, more rodents. Um, that we are not trying to feed as much. Uh, next, we have nest boxes. Um, a lot of the same basic ideas here. Um, you do want to clean them out about once a year. Um, they do have different uh, nest parasites that are in there, little um, kind of like flea-like things. So. You will probably want to wear gloves and be careful when you clean those out. Um, but that is really good for the birds to clean them out. That helps reduce the number of nest parasites that you have. Again, we have problems with these invasive species. Um, we don't really want to be providing more resources for these species because they do like I said, have a negative impact on our native birds. Um, especially these house sparrows are very aggressive things um, and they can be really aggressive with the nest boxes. Um, if they find a nest box that is occupied by a bluebird or by a, a tree sparrow, um, if they want that house, they will kill those birds and take over the nest. Um, so you really have to watch for these birds. Um, if you're in a more residential area. A lot of times if you try to put up a nest box, you will end up housing the house sparrows and the starlings. Um, so it's something that you want to watch. Sometimes these boxes are better in areas, um, maybe like a larger field, like a golf course would be better for bluebirds because the house sparrows will not be around there as much. Um, this is also a little bit complicated. If you have questions about how to successfully set up a nest box and support native species, um, feel free to give us an email about that. Um, here are a couple different um, ways that you can help out your birds. Um, so this thing in the middle here is a predator guard and those are really nice. Um, that prevents like a, a raccoon or a snake or, or anything like that from, from crawling up that pole and getting into the nest box. So a predator guard like this can be really, really helpful um, for keeping the baby birds safe. Um, over here on the left is a system um, that seems to work with trying to um, scare away house sparrows um, once a, a bluebird or, or tree swallow has moved into a house. Um, apparently if you put these up after the good birds have moved in, the, those birds will, will continue using it, but the sparrows will be kind of scared away from these moving in the wind. There's a lot of different ways um, and different techniques that people have come up with um, trying, trying to keep house sparrows out of those nest boxes. Um, and and there's, there's none that are completely foolproof, um, but there's a lot of good ones that you can try and that you can look into. Um, lastly, on the right here, this is a little, um, like a little guard, a little cap. Um, a metal thing here um, and, and that prevents birds from like woodpeckers or squirrels from enlarging this hole um, and once they enlarge that hole then you can end up um, not not hosting who you were planning to host or um, like making it turn into a uh, squirrel nest box um, so that's a, that's another good thing to put on there um, so you can keep the hole the right size for the right bird that you are trying to support. Um, so that brings me to this website here. Uh, Nestwatch.org is really helpful for showing you the different houses that you can put up in your area um, and for the different birds that you can try to attract. Um, it's really nice you put the area that you live in 
Great Lakes. Um, and then you can see what kind of habitat you're in. A lot of us are in towns, but some people might be more in a possibly a grassland or a forested area. And so you can mark what kind of habitat you have around you. Um, and they will show you all the birds that you can attract um, that, that will use a type of nest box because not all birds do. Um, and, and then they'll show you designs for those nest boxes that you can make yourself. So um, these are a couple different designs. Um, that are really nice because they, the house sparrows and the starlings will not use these. Um, so, so they kind of help not have to deal with that issue. Um, this one on the right is a little ledge and the robins love this little ledge type thing. Um, and uh, morning doves will use this as well. Um, so those are really nice and, and easy to make. Um, and this is another one that I found recently um that is a barn swallow nest that you can whoop, that you can put up um and i i mean there's pictures of it that show it working but i've i've never used this um but it seems like it would work and it's it's very nice for um supporting these birds that that are um struggling with population numbers uh, another thing that you can do to help birds is offering nesting material. Um, I like this one a lot. Um, you can brush your pets and then you can just put that hair outside and let it float around and, and many birds will like using that as nesting material. Um, the only thing that you want to be aware of is make sure you haven't recently applied any any chemicals to your animals um, such as like a, a flea or tick um, anything on the fur like that, that could end up being harmful to the birds. Um, so if you're sure that there's no possible chemicals in your pet's fur, then you can brush your pets outside and let the fur just flow away and the, the birds will use it and they'll use it to make their nests nice and, um, soft and cozy and warm for the babies. So I love that. Um, you do want to make sure there's several different things that you don't want to use. Um, string can be really harmful. Um, birds will commonly get it caught around their legs um, and that can be really problematic. Um, so you don't want to use that. Um, nothing plastic. Um, and then dryer lint can also have a lot of chemicals in it. So don't put your dryer lint outside thinking that the birds might use it. And now we have gotten to uh, vegetation. Um, so I am going to hand it over to Michelle and she will talk about plants for us. Hi everyone. Um, as Ava mentioned, I'm going to talk about plants. So we're going to go to the natural aspect now of attracting birds to your yard. And this is really important because if you look at things historically and ecologically, birds and plants are co-adapted to one another. We have plants that are attractive to birds um, and plants that need birds to disperse their seeds um, and even for pollination in some cases. So if you have your typical lawn, which Ava's going to show you next, you'll notice that there's really nothing there for the birds. It doesn't attract the insects that they eat. There are no food plants there. It's basically an ecological wasteland. Um, also on our lawns, we tend to use a lot of water, a lot of other resources, fertilizers, chemicals, and it's work for us. And it's, it's pretty in its own way, but it's not great ecologically. So we wanna try and reduce lawn. We have to get rid of it if we're attracting birds, but we would like to reduce it. We want a nice mix between natural areas, and it doesn't have to be this wild looking, and then the open space for us, because and let our dogs run and stuff like that. So we need that balance. So you don't have to get rid of your lawn. Um, you also don't necessarily have to get rid of your landscaping, but most landscaping does not include what we would consider native plants. And native plants are those that are endemic historically to an area. And the birds and other wildlife in that area, especially the insects, would have co-evolved with those plants. Most of the plants that we have in the horticultural industry come from Asia some from Europe and Africa, but most are from Asia. So our animals here are just not to those. They don't know how to use them. 
If you don't see holes in your leaves, that means it's not food for something. So what you want to do is introduce more native plants into your home. And those native plants can be flowering plants, shrubs, trees, grasses. There's an entire variety that will be used by wildlife. And you can make it pretty. I really like the wildflower look. Um, so plants supply a number of things for birds. Number one, they supply insects. Um, the insects are attracted to plants as pollinators. They're attracted to plants for the food that they provide in terms of leaves, shelter, and that's the number one food for songbird baby birds. Um, chickadees like this, as it says, will bring so many caterpillars to the nest every day. You never knew there were that many caterpillars out there, and they're not big like monarch caterpillars or black swallowtail caterpillars. They're little green guys. And they'll just keep feeding these high protein, high nutrient, high fat foods to their babies to help them grow. So this is like the number one baby food. Our native species that these insects are adapted to will support hundreds of different species of caterpillars. So not just hundreds of caterpillars, hundreds of species of caterpillars. Non-native plants like this Asian ginkgo, not so many. Even though some of these plants have been in the United States for many years, decades, even centuries, our wildlife has not adapted to them very well. So you want to try and stick with natives as much as possible. Um, the trees that are listed here, this is by, uh, from research done by Doug Tallamy, who is an entomologist out of New Jersey um, and an advocate for home backyard habitats. So these are really great trees to have in your yard. Now, keep in mind, if you're going to plant an oak tree, if you have a teeny little sapling, it's gonna take years for it to grow. Some of these other trees may grow a little faster. Some may fit in your yard conditions, some may not. So you have to kind of research what works best for your space and the time that you wanna put into it. Then when those leaves fall off the trees, you know, we have this thing that where we have to rake them all up um, number one, that removes the nutrients that the trees have taken out of the soil. And then when we put that on the curb, all those nutrients go away. But for the birds, it's really important to have those leaves as a place to find food. Um, invertebrates, not just insects, but other things like centipedes, millipedes, all that stuff will hide in those leaves because um, it's moist and dark and they find their food there. And especially our migratory thrushes, catbirds, thrashers. It's so fun to watch them go back in the leaves and start throwing leaves around, um, looking for those little bits of food. So it's also a place where um, butterflies and moths will have their chrysalises and um, cocoons through the winter. So leaving the leaves there is really important in a lot of ways ecologically. But for our birds, it provides a good food source. All right, berries and fruits. We like to eat these things, so do the birds. We, we don't always wanna share, you know, we don't wanna share our raspberries and our strawberries all the time, but there's plenty of other things that we can plant for the birds. Um, not all birds are fruit eaters. Most of them will pick at it a little. Cardinals, robins will eat fruits. Um, cedar waxwings, 90% of their adult diet is fruit. So not as many birds eat fruit, but they will, especially during fall migration, when there are some high fat content fruits that they can eat to bulk up while they're migrating. So these are really important um, and they're pretty, and we can eat some of them too. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those. He was gonna give me my next slide here. And there we have a cedar waxwing eating service berry. If I have to recommend one plant to provide fruit for birds, this would be it. It's a very nice small tree, grows in a number of conditions. It has white flowers early in the spring before it has leaves, so it's beautiful to see. Uh, easy to take care of. The fruit is yummy. Uh, Juneberry is another word for this tree. You won't ever get the fruit though, because the birds are gonna get it way before you do. Um, the cedar waxwings, the robins, the cat thrushes, they'll all enjoy the service berry. And then in the fall, you get beautiful fall foliage. So if you have to pick one fruit plant for your yard, I would recommend service berries. 
Pokeweed is one of my all-time favorites. Um, the birds love it, time fat. The thrushes will eat it on their way through in fall migration. But as the name suggests, it is kind of weedy. Um, it's very pretty with the bright pink stems and um, panicles for the fruit, but it is toxic to other animals. Most animals won't go and eat it, um, and hopefully small children don't either, but it, is, it can be toxic. So if you've got a place that you could have it away from pets and children, that would be great. It does get quite large, but it is a phenomenal food source for migrating fall birds. And then you've got some that hold on to their fruit um, through the fall and winter. This fruit is called persistent. Um, crab apples are an example of some of the persistent fruits we have, but this is a native one. This is Eastern red cedar. And you'll see here is the cedar waxwing again. So they're looking for those late season fruits prior to migration and also um, through the winter. The other really nice thing about evergreens is they have a dual purpose. They also serve as shelter through the winter for our birds. So when you're planting things, keep those things in mind too. They may have more than one job that they can provide for birds. And Ava's gonna give me my next slide here. Here we go, oh, nectar. So yeah, you can do the sugar and water thing and that's great for hummingbirds, but it's even better if they can get a natural nectar source. This will provide other nutrients for them that the straight sugar may not. Wild columbines are blooming right now. So I just went outside to our gardens on Wayne State's campus today and they're in full bloom. They're one of the first food sources that will arise in the spring for migrating hummingbirds, which are coming through right now. Um, it's a really easy plant, grows almost anywhere and you can grow it from seed. Wild bergamot is a mint family member. Um, it's got this really cool crown of flowers. And even though it's not red, hummingbirds still know to use this plant. Um, and so do hummingbird clear wing moths. They will use it as well. So it's a really cool plant to have, and you can make tea out of it. So you can use it too. But vine is a hummingbird favorite. They've got these deep red coral color flowers. Um, but trumpet vine can be an aggressive plant. So you need to have a lot of space to have this plant successfully. It doesn't always bloom either. So you can have the plant for years and it doesn't do anything. And then finally, you'll get these clusters of red flowers all over the place after you've got this monster plant in your backyard. So this is one, if you've got the space and you wanna try it and you're gonna keep it trimmed, go for it because it's a great plant for hummingbirds. Nuts and seeds um, are only for a select group of birds. If you think about nuts and seeds, they're pretty hard. So most birds with very small beaks can't eat them. So we're talking about finches, sparrows, gross beaks like cardinals and rose-breasted gross beaks, and other birds like blue jays and chickadees that are smart enough to figure out how to eat nuts and seeds. Um, blue jays like some of the bigger nuts. So beech nuts and hickory nuts are good for them. Great for turkeys too, if you want to have turkeys in your backyard. Uh, probably not down here in Detroit, though I did see a turkey on Wayne State's campus last year. Um, but these are trees that you're going to have to invest time in. So when you plant it, it's going to be years before you actually get mast, which is what the seeds are called. Easier to grow and producing seed for a wider range of birds are a lot of flowers. Purple coneflower is one that's known very well, but all of the different coneflowers do produce seeds that the birds eat. Um, Gray-headed coneflower is a yellow-flowered member um, of the family, and goldfinches love the seeds. I would go try and collect seeds so I could grow the plants the next year, and the goldfinches would beat me to it. Um, and then they'll like spread a little extra for you, so they'll get up there and eat it all up, and then some of the seeds will spread, and you'll get a little, few more plants the next year. So coneflowers of all kinds, both echinaceas and rutabecchias, great for seed eating birds. But to get those seeds, that means you have to let the flower die or at least the petals fall off. So we get this kind of unattractive dark colored head sometimes, the vegetation starts to die off, but that's when the seeds are being formed within the plant. So you have to kind of leave those up. You don't have to leave all of them. Um, you may not want some of the extra seeds spreading around in your yard and making new plants but leave enough for the birds and leave them throughout the winter. 
A lot of people do fall cleanup, which means you're removing the leaves and the stalks and the seed heads. Those seed heads are really birds all through the winter. They'll keep picking at them. They'll also go after insects that are overwintering in the leaves and stems. So I don't do my garden cleanup until late spring. It may be unattractive a little bit. You can kind of cut it back and trim it, but it's best to leave it there for the birds and the insects that they'll eat. Then plants serve a different function other than just food for caterpillars that the insects eat or the birds eat and the fruits and other things that the birds eat. It's also the place where they're gonna build their nests, hang out when the weather's bad. So you wanna think about this when you're also planting things. They may not serve a food purpose, but they may serve another function. A lot of birds will, um, within very dense foliage, um, they'll also hang out there in the winter. Two of my favorites for this purpose are ones that we use all the time in foundation plantings. Um, the cedars, red cedars one, we use white cedar a lot, which is arborvitae. Um, Eastern hemlock is another very dense plant. So these are great uh, things to have for wintering birds. And I'll just dive in and out of them through the winter. You can also put up a brush pile. Now this may look unattractive. This is not something you want where people are gonna see it all the time. And depending on your city ordinances, you may not be able to have them. But insects will hang out in here and little birds like wrens, oven birds, thrushes, they'll go darting in and out looking for insects. Brush piles are really fun to have. Um, I actually had Eastern Tohe in my backyard here in downtown Detroit this summer. So that was very exciting, both male and female. I had Thrasher back here, and I just love to watch them go in and out of those brush piles. The other thing is when you lose a tree or you lose a branch on a tree, sometimes it's okay to leave it if it's not going to be dangerous um, in terms of falling on you or anything else, because some of these birds are cavity nesters. These are the birds that we provide birdhouses for. Not all birds use birdhouses because they're not all cavity nesters. Um, but this is a natural source for them to uh, nest in. Um, woodpeckers usually start things out because they've got the beaks to make the holes, but then other birds will use old woodpecker holes later on or someplace where a branch is dropped off and you have a natural cavity. It's also a good place for them to find insects under the bark. So if it's safe, leave it there for now. I had an old box elder that died in my backyard and I just had the uh, fellow come and trim it just so it would have a tall enough space for the birds to get up. You want it to be high enough up so they feel safe away from the ground. And that was it. And the flickers came and made a beautiful hole that the starlings took over. Um, so by taking what you've got and just tweaking it a little, you don't have to go all the way away from what you've got, but just adding those elements that the birds need at all levels, leaving the leaves at the ground level, building a little higher up with your vegetation for the flowers and the seeds, free, um, and trees then for them to nest in, hide in, and build their nest, um, get fruit and, and nuts from. So you wanna go with levels um, and what suits your area. So it's really important to know what your soil is like, how much sunlight you have, um, and what may have grown in that area historically. There's a couple sources for that. We'll talk more about that next week at our webinar, so come back for that. But it's really great to know what you have. And then you can get something like this, a backyard habitat certification. That says, I'm doing what I need to do. I'm providing food, water, and shelter for these birds, either resident birds who are here all year, migratory birds who are just using our backyard as like McDonald's for birds um, as they're flying through on their migration routes. These are really important places for birds and they need us to help them out with that. Because if you look at what Ava showed us earlier, when they fly over, most of what they're seeing is lawn and houses and cement. That is not a safe place, that is not a food place. But if you start planting small places that they can use, they will come. Um, I had a half an acre in Roseville, of all places, Gratiot, I-94, 12 mile, 696, and in the time I was there, I had over 70 species of bird come and visit my yard. Indigo buntings, scarlet tanagers, all kinds of sparrows, and warblers like you wouldn't believe. 
So it was a very exciting thing to me to know that I was providing something that they needed and they would come back year after year. So you can do this too. And then you get the little sign and you put it out front so your neighbors know what the heck you're doing and they don't go, oh, what are those crazy with that weedy looking yard? I'm providing habitat for wildlife, for birds, which everybody likes. And then your neighbors can go, oh, I can sit in my backyard and watch my neighbor's birds. Cool. <laughs> So, native plants, way to go. Thank you, Michelle. That was You're great. Um, and this, this map that I put in here, it, it shows how these, these spaces really add up. Every little space, every backyard, every bit of native plants at a park, all of these come together to create a corridor of habitat for wildlife. Um, so, Every, every plant, every little thing that you do can have a really big difference, especially when all of it comes together. Um, so now we can move on to questions. Um, and yeah, any thoughts or comments as well? Um, we love getting emails from you guys um, or give us a call. Uh, we're around, we're at home, um, but we're still working. So we're around um, for any uh, thoughts that you guys might have. Uh, and Sarah, do we have some questions? We sure do. Um, so the first one we had was back when you were speaking at the beginning. Um, what is the contribution of disease? I remember a few years ago, there was some disease that significantly reduced the numbers of crows around Metro Detroit. Yeah, um, we had um, West Nile virus um, came through a while ago. Um, and I remember that. I remember when we used to have a lot of crows and the number really dropped. Um, but, but West Nile virus was, was not really, it, it was not increased by feeders in any way. Um, I don't know as much about West Nile virus, but I don't, I don't think that there was some way that humans were making it any worse for the crows. But besides the initial spread of West Nile virus over to the US with our mosquitoes that we have spreading the disease. Um, but the Finch Eye Syndrome is one where I believe it was transferred through bacteria. And so if a bird with the Finch Eye Syndrome was feeding from a feeder, it could spread the Finch Eye Syndrome to other birds. Um, Finch Eye Syndrome is really the biggest disease I know about that was a problem around feeders. Um, but that one, you can see, um, usually it's a finch that might have like a really gunky eye. And if you do ever see anything like that, just take your feeders down for a little bit. Um, so that you can make sure that you are not spreading that to other birds. Great. Um, our next question was, since a few minutes before this webinar started, we have had a hummingbird perched on our hummingbird feeder. We're yes. relatively new at hummingbird feeding. Is this normal? Yeah, I definitely say that's normal. Um, yeah, I, they, they usually are moving around a lot, but I'm, I'm sure that they'll sometimes take a little rest and rest their wings. And um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's totally normal and, and a good moment for the bird to feel safe and catch its breath. Um, so that's really wonderful. Great. Um, and someone asked if these slides would be available after this. Yeah, we can send them out. And then I do also have, um, I made just like a little sheet that we will send out as well. Um, just so that you guys have as much information available to you as you need. Um, I also have on these sheets, I have um, native plant nurseries. I have native plant um, websites that you can use and, and a couple of um, our favorite books. Um, Michelle helped me with that, with those resources. Um, they're, they're all of her favorites. Um, so those will be going out as well. So hopefully you guys can remember and retain and use all of this information. Great. Um, someone else asked, does the city of Detroit support more natural yards like this or do they issue blight tickets? That's a great, great question. Um, the city of Detroit is changing 
a little bit. Um, part of that is because of our um, Detroit Bird City program. Um, you can see my background is Callahan Park, um, which is where our, our kind of first um, pilot park for this program where we are replacing um, turf grass areas like Michelle mentioned, turf grass really doesn't do anything. Um, so we're replacing that with these native plants. A whole field of native plants. Um, and these serve kind of three purposes. Um, they provide for wildlife, they look really beautiful for residents, and these plants are less work for the city. So the city um, has been working with us and is, is kind of dipping their toe into and looking more into um, the use of native plants. Um, there, there is still the chance of those tickets. I think the little sign that Michelle mentioned um, can be helpful to make sure that people know what you're doing. Um, you can also make a very typical kind of English garden style garden with native plants. It doesn't have to look as wild. You can still use native plants as a little garden. Um, so that is, that is something to really be, it's good to be um, aware of that. Um, but I think the city is becoming more open to um, the use of native plants and, and recognizing that habitat looks a little bit different than a perfectly polished front yard. Great. Um, the next question, of all the species of sparrows, are the house sparrows on the only that are aggressive and territorial? And how can we attract indigo buntings? <laughs> Yes. So, so the year, the, the house sparrows are the ones that are the invasive. I don't think we have any other um, non-native sparrows. And I think most of the other, most of the native sparrows are pretty docile. Um, I do not know why house sparrows are such they're little fighter things. They're just, they're so aggressive and they're, they're extremely opportunistic, which is really helpful living with a, with a human changing environment. Um, they're kind of, they're risk takers. Um, so, so other birds will not risk getting close to people. Well, the house sparrows, I mean, you'll see them around, around little coffee shops eating the crumbs. And that's why we have so many house sparrows. They really are a very aggressive, opportunistic, spreading species. They just do very, very well. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of other sparrows. We have our chipping sparrows, tree sparrows, song sparrows, um, fox sparrows, all of our wonderful native sparrows. I'm pretty sure all of those are, are significantly less aggressive. Um, indigo buntings, I think, are mainly insect eaters. They will definitely be getting insects to feed their babies. Um, I think indigo buntings will sometimes eat seed. For some reason, I have a image of an indigo bunting eating the the thistle seed. Um, yeah. Ava. Yes. Yeah, Michelle, <laughs> chime in. Yes, you know do. this. Um, yeah. So seed, also some fruit sometimes. Um, oh, I will do that. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I click on it. There we go. There we go. So indigo buntings um, are designed to eat seed. Uh, Niger, they'll eat smaller seeds, insects for sure, and they will also take fruit. They are relatively shy species, so they don't tend to hang out in very open spaces. Um, I would see them in my backyard in the shrubbery toward the back away from the house. And where I've seen the most is in fairly um, densely wooded areas toward the tops of the trees. So, um, and I'm sure Ava has seen them in different places too. One of the things with backyard habitat, you have to have a sense for what the bird likes um, and try and recreate some of that for them. But for migratory stopover habitats, birds will use just about anything it looks like it provides the food that they need. Cool, thank you. Um, so we have a few more questions about plants. So someone asked lots of great ideas for plants to help birds, but what do I do about the deer? 
<laughs> um, Michelle, I think you would be I able to answer that better than I'll me. This one. Um, a couple things. First of all, native plants also adapted to be around white-tailed deer. Um, so native plants in Michigan are used to that. They get munched a little. Um, I've had plants get munched down to the ground, but once they're established, native plants typically have fairly decent root systems, so they can bounce back. Some don't taste very good for deer. Um, so sometimes you just have to try things until the deer figure out they don't like it and they leave it alone. Um, you can protect some of your plants. I grew a lot of raspberries and um, blackberries and roses. So I would take the canes that I had cut and trimmed and make little cages around some of my plants when they were at their most tender and I was just starting them out. And that seemed to keep the birds and the bunnies both out because the rabbits will take things down too. Um, so you just kind of have to try things, cross your fingers and hope the deer leave it alone. Um, I had more problems with rabbits in my yard, but then I lived in the city. Okay. Um, another question, where can we buy native plants locally? None of our garden stores seem to carry very many varieties. They not only don't carry many varieties, those plants are um, technically not native. Um, you can have a purple cone flower, which may or may not have been native to Michigan, but most of the ones in the horticultural trade are not grown here in Michigan, so they're not what we consider local genotype. They're not adapted to our climate and our conditions. There are uh, a number of native plant vendors. One is in um, Okemos, but he does business with garden clubs throughout the area. So I know the St. Clair Shores Yardeners are, are going to be having their plant sale in uh, June. They'll be selling native plants. There's a pre-order form for them. North Oakland Wild Ones, they're going to have a plant sale. Cranbrook usually hosts one. So you can get some native plants in the area. You can grow some of them fairly easily from seed. Um, the resource that Ava's going to share has a contact for the Michigan Wildflower Farm, and you can try little sample seed packets and start some of them from seed. Um, there's also a native plant grower in Ann Arbor who usually works out of Carytown Market. Um, I don't know how much he's doing right now. He was ill for a few years. But the more that there's demand for this, the more that we'll start finding things. Um, Keep Growing Detroit has quite a few native plants that they're growing for rain garden projects, but they also do sell them. And I work with a group of students here on Wayne State's campus. And when we had our farmer's market, we would sell native plants there as well. So the interest is catching on. And the more you kind of put that out there, the economic push gets more of that going. But if you have a chance and we get through this COVID-19 thing, visiting wild type in, um, is actually in Mason, Michigan, is a field trip all by itself. And then you can get see all, all the birds hanging out at his place because he's got all these native plants there. Um, so it's really cool. Cool, thank you. Um, we have a couple questions about the best way of identifying weeds and getting rid, how to get rid of existing grass and weeds. Um, do you have any quick recommendations for those? Um, identification, I can give Ava a link that has a really good ID guide for seedlings, so you can identify them when they're really little. Um, I actually do a program called Weedling or Seedling, sometimes for some of the garden clubs, but um, for safely removing um, grass, you can smother it. That's probably the most organic and best way to do it. Uh, layers of newspaper or cardboard, lots of mulch on top, prevents it from getting sunlight and water and air, and eventually it will decompose, and then you can plant things there. Um, if you want it to go a little faster, you can lay tarp or heavy plastic, um, not clear plastic because the sunlight will still get there. It'll start to cook the plants underneath and again, smother them. So that's the best way to grass. Great, thank you. Um, what about lavender? Do birds like lavender? Probably not too much. I don't know of any offhand that do. Some of our pollinators do, and some of the birds will eat some of the small pollinators. But for birds in and of itself, no, nah, it's not native. Okay. They don't know how to use it. Um, someone asked about if birds like rain gardens. Yes. Um, we tend to put a lot of native plants in rain gardens because they're adapted to the 
inundated and then dry conditions like swamp milkweed and a lot of the plants that re they recommend, many of those are also very good for birds. Definitely. Great. Um, we had a question about fighting off chipmunks and squirrels for fun feeders and what bird species tend to visit bird baths most? I give that to um, Ava. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, my, my dad has come up with a couple good ways to prevent the squirrels. Um, we've used like large pieces of a flat kind of metal material. Um, and, and if it is a, like, a, like a pole sticking up, um, you can put that on the bottom and then the squirrels can't get past that. Or if it's something hanging down, you can put this large flat piece of metal on the top and the squirrels can't get past it. Um, since it's a totally smooth piece of metal, the squirrels can't like grip it at all. Um, and then there's, there's a ton of different, um, I'm sure far better, um, squirrel baffles. Um, is what they're called, and they're things that you can add to feeders um, that that help the squirrels not be able to get to the food, and then the squirrels eventually leave it alone, and then the feeder is open for the birds. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know of which which might be the best type, um, but there's definitely a lot out there, um, and then. I would say all birds have to visit the bird bath because everything drinks water. Um, I do know that um, house sparrows also like to do like little dust baths, which is also really cute. But I think, I think they still do baths in water as well. Um, I don't think there's any bird that would not for any reason. Um, they, all, they all need water to drink and all of them um, will, will need a bath to help cool off in the summertime. Excellent. We just had, we had one more question about showing, if we could show a picture of a house sparrow compared to native sparrows. I don't know yeah, this is, this is a tricky thing. And this is, um, again, with my dad, we, we, he'll always point out a sparrow and be like, is that a, is that a house sparrow or is that a, we call them fancy sparrows when they're really just native sparrows. Um, but, but practicing how to identify those is great. And, and I think that that's helpful to, to recognize your house sparrows. That way, when one of the fancy sparrows shows up, you, you can see it and you're like, oh, that's a chipping sparrow. Yay. It's very exciting. Um, I can pull up, I can try to pull up something. Um, but I think it's actually very easy if you go um, look at look at house sparrows on um, the Cornell Merlin website. Um, if you scroll to the bottom of the identifications page, I'll, I'll do this. I just have to figure out my screen sharing. Um, you can uh, look at the different birds. At the bottom, it will say similar species. And so it will show you all the birds that look similar, that are, that are very likely to be confused with that bird. Um, and that can be really helpful for comparing. Um, oh, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. No problem. Are you able to see my screen looking at something different? No? Not, not yet. You're going to have to switch it to a different. Okay. I will. Um, I'll pull it up and then I'll, I'll switch my screen. Okay. Are there any other questions? I think that someone just asked about, Doug Tellamy mentions a bubbler in his latest book to be used year round. Where can I find out more about these? I don't know if either of you are familiar with that. Um, I'm not super familiar. I don't know where you would find one. I'm guessing any garden store or Amazon would, would have them. Um, but I think they're nice because I think when they can, when they, when they hear the sound of the water, it helps them um, realize that it's there. And so you might draw in more birds. Um, do you have any other thoughts on that, Michelle, with bubblers or fountains? I've never used anything like that. I had a pond that I kept going all year. So that was good for attracting the birds through the winter. Um, when I had my bird baths, though, I had a heater in my bird bath, mm -hmm. uh, which was just a little metal ring that I put in the bath. Um, I know some of the wild bird stores that specialize in feeders and baths and birdhouses carry some of that stuff too. And they have people that are a little more expert at that than I would be because they 
do it all the time. Okay, now can you guys see my screen yeah. about house sparrows? Yes. Okay, so here I'm at, I'm all at allaboutbirds.org. Um, I just searched house sparrow and this is one of the first things that came up. Um, so here are a couple pictures of the house sparrows. This is the breeding male. Um, so he has this chestnut, um, the black bib, and the black around his eye. That's pretty distinct. The males are pretty easy to identify. Um, the females are pretty nondescript, so they can be a little bit trickier to identify. Um, the, one, the one thing to kind of look out for is this kind of blonde, tan um, mark going from the back of their eye. And then if I scroll down to the bottom, compare it with similar species, um, these are not the best species to compare it with. Um, but, oh, here I can keep, keep scrolling through. Um, so so a, a house finch is something that looks a little bit similar. So you can click through these and, and click on the different birds um, and um, look at, look at um, the different birds that they think is, they think are similar. I still don't think that these are very good birds to compare it with. <laughs> I'm gonna find a chipping sparrow. <laughs> and is, is that? That is all the questions on here. Okay, so yeah, here's, here's the chipping sparrow. You can look at these pictures. Um, and then again, there's, here more more things to compare it with so you can scroll through and look at all the sparrows and um, using just a bird guy is al al also um, a good way to learn your sparrows they are very tricky they're all very similar but they're fun to learn okay well uh, th that's all of our questions that's it great um, thank you everyone for joining yeah. us for this presentation um, we will be sending out that information to help you guys um, find everything you need, the nurseries, the books, the websites, um, and, and definitely email us. And if you have any plants specific questions, um, we can also send out um, Michelle's email so that you can contact her about any specific uh, native plant questions. And join us again next week for oh, yes. more in depth on native plants. We will be uh, sending well. out, yes, um, that will be in our email, it's on our website, um, that will be more, more good options for native plants um, that are good for this area and for the birds around us. So yeah, we're really excited. Yep. Thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you again next week. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.